Dead Space 2 seems to have taken a Theseus's ship approach to sequel design, replacing all the parts of the previous game with newer, but fundamentally similar parts. Just like that paradox, though, it leaves you wondering if something was lost in the transition. Dead Space 2 as a whole seems to have pursued the idea of amplifying every aspect of the first Dead Space that's stuck, and as a result comes out a lot more entertaining, but also less effective. It's disingenuous to say that Dead Space 2 isn't a better game in a basic sense, a game that is made incredibly difficult to criticize because of how fun it is to play and its constant air of defensive self-awareness. Every time the game seems to drop a narrative ball or introduce an uninteresting mechanic, it stares back at you and winks, it toys with your expectations, and, while basically just making a bigger, badder version of the first game, there are some confident changes to the formula found throughout. There was an obvious leap made here for a spot on the top shelf. The developers made it very clear they were looking to tone down the stress levels and bring in a more focused, filmic narrative line, but at the same time somehow made something that feels a lot more like a video game than the previous title did. I think the quickest and easiest jumping off point to clarify that statement can be found with the level design. It's across the board absolutely breathtaking and varied. They also have pretty much entirely gotten rid of the backtracking found in the first Dead Space, and the few areas they do have the player retrace their steps are used to further a secondary goal, like showing the player how quickly the necromorph's infectious material has spread across the ship. But because Visceral acted in favor of a more guided, varied experience, the game has obviously partitioned the levels. There's a chapter in a church, there's a chapter in a school, there's that chapter on the ship from the first game. Even though the first game had those terrible chapter-completed sections, it felt like a much more singular experience, albeit a slightly more repetitive one as well. A nice analog can be seen in Dark Souls 2, which has a pretty outrageous amount of variety in its environmental design, and even though control is pretty much never taken away from the player, nobody's getting fooled when you're riding elevators and plodding through extended corridors from the toxic level to the lava level to the dragon level and so on. Repetition is an extremely effective tool, and it's upsetting to think that developers are scared of possibly boring a bit of the player base in spite of the game's overall potency. The amount of respect for the game world in Dead Space 2 holds it all above the water, though. The game is separated into a few parts that work a lot like episodes of Law and & Order. There's an overarching narrative carrying the game forward, but each of these acts are mostly self-contained and focus on relatively simple but high-stakes objectives. The level design has grown from this, with everything clearly belonging to the same world but all having major differences between between them. The narrative is something that critics were divided about at the game's release, but with most of them applauding Isaac's characterization and how it pushed the gameplay forward while bringing a psychedelic intensity to the game's mood. I think it's largely a train wreck. Isaac in the first game was a husk, an empty shell for which to slip yourself into. It works in Half-Life 2 just as much as it works in Twilight, but it's also something uniquely effective in gaming because you're actually in control of what's taking place. Isaac now has a personality, but calling it that would be a compliment that it never comes close to earning. The first game had an issue with this as well because Isaac was repeatedly placed in situations where he would have been expected to speak, being contacted by other people, or even being thrown into the same room with people that were speaking to him. It was strange watching Isaac be so, be so complacent about the position he was in. It was an odd development decision. The game would have been quite a bit more interesting if Isaac had been the only one left alive after the collision with the Ishimara at the beginning of the game, being dragged around by maybe old recordings of Nicole or some other more natural-feeling objective drip. There are a number of solutions to the problem, none of which include turning Isaac into the bleeding, sarcastic mess that is found in Dead Space 2. The developers don't waste much time showing that things are going to be working differently in this game. Isaac is talking in the opening cutscene, while being rudely interviewed by a guy who conveniently summarizes the events of the first game. It also shows that Nicole is going to have a much bigger role now, again as a point of torment for Isaac. What did it say to you, Isaac? Isaac, Isaac, can you hear me? Isaac is now an irritating contradiction, a helpless killing machine, even as B-movie silliness the characterization is shoved down your throat so quickly that, like a man of steel, it can feel like you're watching the abridged version of something better. But the biggest problem is how Nicole is again used as plot stuffing. It seems like whenever the developers felt the player might feel motivationally confused, they toss in a trippy moment where Nicole drags Isaac forward. The clever people at Visceral covered their asses here though, because this is kind of the entire point of her character in the first place. Another place 
place where they covered their ass is found in the other two women in the game that Isaac is in contact with. He trusts them too immediately and with far too little information. This could be explained by Isaac being so wholly destroyed and guilt-ridden by the death of Nicole that these two conveniently attractive young ladies might have a stronger influence on his decision-making skills. But it's never fun to try and make excuses for the plot of the game you're playing. And as gaming has grown up, we've seen developers held to a much higher standard when it comes to storytelling and pacing in general. This tormented, psychotic Isaac is forced and overexposed, and the fact that his mental instability is one of the only constant threads that the player follows throughout the experience makes for a pretty tiresome game to try and invest yourself fully into. The places that these stories unfold in, though, are really great, and the points that the story touches on creates some memorable set pieces. They touch on deeply rooted themes in horror that the first game's setting couldn't logically make room for. The reoccurring stuff revolving around children is a bit too much and bordering on hilarious at times. Sections that other reviewers cited as disturbing, like a crying baby being heard inside a tumbling washing machine, or a mother beckoning her child which explodes on arrival, are definitely hard to forget, but not because I was horrified. It works, though, and these parts were a lot more compelling of a reason to continue playing the game than anything else. It's not scary, but it's fun to explore, even if some of the thematic individuality was lost. The fact that they were taking themselves a bit less seriously this time around creates more moments than it took away. And it kind of gave some mental wiggle room if the player wasn't in the mood to sit down and get stressed after a long day of work. The developers have sliced off a ton of the horror aspects, but somehow kept the appealing core of the horror experience mutilated bodies, outrageous deaths, and familiar environments covered in gore. The attention to detail is just as strong as in the first game. It's in the little things, like the marker that slowly assembles in the background of the main menu as you progress through the game, or the fact that the light behind Isaac's helmet actually casts shadows. But of course, the art direction behind the environmental design is the most consistently impressive, and with more varied locations, the art team went wild. The careful balance of mood was maintained from the first game, but amplified further. The brights are brighter and the darks are darker, making the transitions between them all the more striking. But the cycle is run through one too many times, and the quiet moments become significantly less powerful as the game rolls forward. By the time you're crashing through the walls of the government sector on the top of a massive mining drill, only to discover a large, quiet room, you just want the game to get on with it. But thankfully, it is gorgeous to look at, and finding the dark browns replaced by clean lines and blinding lights can apologize apologize for the pacing issues. The pacing issues are mostly just born from the obvious desire to pack the game with as many moments as possible, as if the team had a ton of set piece ideas before they began creating the game, and then they just crafted the game around them. But when looking at each level individually, a few of them are crafted with such mastery that they can slough off any criticism that you pile onto them. The game has an extremely strong opening, and the initial chapters of confusion and chaos are fantastic. It also shows the player that the Sprawl, the massive space station that Dead Space 2 takes place on, was an organized, urban place that housed a great number of people, and children. Don't forget the children. I can't really fault them for throwing so much kid mutilation at the player. It's a rarely touched on topic in video games, and it seems whenever children are included in games, they're invincible or are used as quick, non-interactive tools to form an easy emotional attachment. Dead Space 2, on the other hand, does exploding babies and toddlers that can rip your arms and legs off. The section of the game where you are wandering through the school, a section that's often cited as the game's most unforgettable area, is admittedly a thrilling and visually enticing experience. The colors are bright and happy and covered in blood, and it's also packed with little visual stories that the original Dead Space did really well. But it's also exploitive to the point where it feels really cheap, especially when they throw in a trippin' with Nicole moment in a toy-filled bedroom. It's also far too detail-packed for any really interesting combat moments, with the fighting mostly being centered around fighting off classrooms of babies, except for the short fight in the gym, which is definitely notable. Revisiting the Ishimaru is great, even if it drags on a bit too long, as well as the birdcage-covered array. But of all the areas in the game, the most interesting were the sections taking place in and below the Church of Unitology. Unitology was a real highlight of the first game for me, and their manner of offering organic exposition about the background of the church is perfectly executed. While it's a clear parody of Scientology, and their own take on the real dangers of religious extremism isn't necessarily subtle, it's really entertaining. As you make your way through, you get a grasp of how opulent, manipulative, and intimidatingly powerful the church had become. There's an impractical number of candles, gift shops, recruitment booths and endlessly large cathedrals. The tall ceilings and stained glass is very grounded in gothic architecture, which has always been a huge touchstone for people making horror entertainment. But it's also heavily inspired by the fictitious religion they've created. Pretty much all the wall patterns and decorative highlights carry the twists of the marker in some form or another. 
The game is firing on all cylinders for the entirety of your time spent in the church, and it also allows for one of the more memorable enemy introductions in the game. The Stalkers are a seriously welcome addition to the roster of Necromorphs. They bring in intelligence and strategic excitement into the encounters. Sadly, you almost always know when you're about to fight them because the rooms they appear in are pretty much always big open areas with storage containers scattered about. But your first time fighting them is hauntingly memorable. During the first chapter that takes place in the church, you enter a massive room with angelic statues stretching all the way to the ceiling. While having a short conversation with the mysterious lady that's dragging you around, a clicky, animalistically conversational sound can be heard. It brings the raptors from Jurassic Park into mind, and you quickly put two and two together that you're about to run into something much smarter than you're accustomed to. They peek around corners and jump from cover to cover, not giving you a good chance to clip off a limb before charging like hell. Their speed is also a chance for the developers to nudge you into using stasis. These nudges have become increasingly less subtle in the transition from Dead Space 1 to Dead Space 2. The first had some jabs thrown at it for constantly reminding the player to chop off the limbs of the necromorphs, and things haven't changed much this time around. Thankfully, it's all done in the style of Dead Space, diegetic and smoothly implemented to not pull the player too far out of the game. Hardcore mode notwithstanding, it does show an upsetting amount of concern for the player's survival. They throw more challenging enemies at Isaac this time around, and, and certainly put the player through more interesting combat encounters. I mean, one of the first fights Isaac has is with one of the most threatening enemies in the game, but at the same time, the tutorials have become a lot more heavy-handed, and repeatedly insist on the use of Kinesis and Stasis as combat tools. In the first game, Kinesis was something really cool that mainly stayed tucked away till the puzzles came around, but Visceral decided to bring it much further further up in the mix. The first two fights in the game require you to kill enemies with Kinesis, there are spear-like objects littering the game world, and there's even an obviously placed, constantly repeating video that explains the process in a manner that's somewhere between embarrassing and hilarious. Watch. You stayed alive three hours using this trick. You see? The developers wanted to send off the game with 100% confidence that at one point every player would rip the limb off a necromorph and kill another with it. Isaac is made a lot more lethal by amplifying these two gameplay mechanics, taking even more steps away from the workmanlike impulses of the first game, where Isaac felt desperate and clumsy. This could easily be explained by claiming his experiences of the first game may have prepared him for his experiences in the second, and this isn't as bad as much as an indication of a change of purpose in the game's general design, largely found in Isaac's traversal of the world and how he acts in combat. The best thing to come out of this is definitely the kinesis. Beyond the barrage of lessons, it's an awesome retooling of a mechanic from the first game. The worst thing to come out of this, besides the frustratingly unnecessary hacking minigame, is how the developer managed stasis, which ended up being an unsatisfying half-measure that could have been somewhat interesting. They should have bit the bullet and either made it a quickly refilling energy bar that would never require refill currency or stations at all, or they should have made it never recharge, which would seriously increase difficulty and make the conservation of stasis packs significantly more important. As it stands, stasis refill stations are everywhere. The mechanic is stuck in an awkward middle point. It's really exploitable in combat, and the placement of the stasis stations immediately solves the already simple physics puzzles. It's like putting the key to a door under the welcome mat. If you're gonna do that, don't even lock the damn door in the first place. I think this is one point that the developers took a little too many slips from the criticism jar of the first game. The kinesis and stasis were admittedly underutilized in the first games, and they attempted to solve the problem with shaky results. There also is the new vent crawling mechanic, if you can even call it that. I'm almost completely neutral towards the addition of this, and the only reason I find it worth mentioning is how hilarious it is that they never use it to provide a jump scare. It's an awesome little move to subvert expectations. I assume they might be placed in locations for technical reasons, like hiding loading screens or something. In making a sequel to a successful debut, there is an expectedly immense pressure of expectation. By playing the first game and second game in quick succession and by doing research on the development of Dead Space 2, the main criticisms digested by Visceral began to surface. They're quoted as saying that they wanted to make the game more accessible, believable, relatable, and immersive. These are things that most developers would have stapled on every wall when working under a publisher like at Electronic Arts, so it comes as no surprise, nor does it beckon much criticism for me when looking at Dead Space 2's gameplay. The game is outrageously fun, and the new weapons added to the game function well, and now that Isaac has left the Ishimara, it opened up an opportunity to have actual weapons instead of having to wrap everything around the idea that they're intended to mostly be mining tools. Killing enemies is now smoother and bloodier, and the methods to kill enemies has grown quite a bit. 
Looking past the major changes like the amplified kinesis, they really just smoothed everything out. The animations are absolutely fantastic. Isaac slumps over and stumbles when his health is low. He moves like he has weight, and there's a ton of character in all of his movements. It's helped by the responsive physics, which all react to Isaac's lumbering feet. The lengthy, brutal death animations of Isaac have also made a return from the first game, this time becoming even longer. In certain sections where you find yourself dying repeatedly, seeing the same few death sequences play out over and over again gets rough. Death in horror games is already a major issue. It pulls you out of the game, but there's a necessity of consequence for playing badly, or against the rules of the game. And death is the most common and generally accepted solution to this problem. In games like Amnesia, though, something is lost after the player's first death. The realization that you can just save and are free to replay certain sections repeatedly until a favorable outcome is found. Dead Space 2 made a strange choice in deciding to make Isaac's death scenes into a strange, macabre reward of their own. And for the early part of the game, they're an occasionally thrilling distraction from the frustration of failure. But they quickly become irritating and accentuate the fact that you're just playing a game. Dying does carry a bigger burden than it does in a lot of other games, though, with the choice to have locked save locations. Reaching a new save point in the game can bring comfort, and when you have the gnawing feeling in the back of your head that you haven't seen a save point in a while, combat becomes a lot more thrilling. And death, and death can carry a hefty punishment. Forgetting to save in return is brutally reprimanded, and the system is archaic. But I think the removal of the system would also remove a bit of the first game's soul that Dead Space 2 had left. The addition of an inventory system to these games also brings a bit of tension to the preservation of life. It can bring false confidence or a sense of worry when you know you're running low on items that can restore life. The minimal UI doesn't hinder your knowledge of how close you've come to dying. The bright bar on Isaac's spine is pretty much always in view, but more importantly, Isaac's mannerisms reflect his condition. He hunches over and stumbles more sloppily when his health is low. It's a fantastic detail that furthers the developer's attempts to give the player relevant information without cluttering the screen up with immersion-breaking nonsense. For most of the people playing the game, this would and will never be that large of a problem, because on the default difficulty level, Dead Space 2 never becomes that hard of an experience. Isaac now feels even better to control on the ground, and the Necromorphs have, haven't seen much of an overhaul to match him. Besides ease of use things, there aren't any major changes to the way he moves except for how he can controls and zero gravity, which when trying to pursue accessibility was probably one of the first points on the developer's list. The zero gravity sections were mostly a missed opportunity in the first game. It's a great idea and basically a requirement for a game like set like this, set in space, to have some moments where you're actually in a vacuum. But it was cramped, slow, and, and dizzying in practice, only working really well when you were heavily guided. One of the largest problems with this is that you had to dedicate to a direction and lost control once you brought Isaac off the ground, and when there were enemies added to the equation it was made even worse. Now, now, you just press a button and bring Isaac into the air where he can maneuver and float around at will. To dilute the distortion, they even added a button that realigns Isaac with the ground. This gives these sections a chance to be larger and much more complicated while also being a lot less frustrating. A problem with how densely packed and massive these sections can be now is that you feel like you're constantly missing stuff or going in a direction that you shouldn't be going, most notably in the larger outdoor areas. They also haven't added any new enemy attack patterns to account for this increased mobility. They did add a large, flower-like necromorph that is basically an organic turret, but they don't make for very interesting combat. I think the ability to fly around in big areas could make for some pretty amazing boss arenas, but instead they're mostly used for large puzzle sequences. The user interface has been altered slightly to accommodate the ability to move Isaac around freely while floating. It looks great, with the guidelines now curving around in the three-dimensional space. This is the largest change to the UI, besides the removal of the map, but this is also the most jarringly different control mechanic added to Dead Space 2. Bosses, for the most part, are completely removed from Dead Space 2. One of them is mostly a cutscene, and the other is against the Marker's incarnation of Nicole, which, like most things involving Nicole, was pretty terrible. When looking back at the first game's three bosses, it seems weird that they never found a reason to have Isaac fighting towering monsters again, instead having the water cooler moments focused on Isaac being tossed about in Mission Impossible-esque action sequences. The game takes the control away from Isaac a lot more this time around, to be able to guide the player's eye to the big set pieces crashing and crumbling around you. And while being enthralling, they're a problem in subsequent playthroughs. There are some visually evocative moments, but I still find the little details and the moment-to-moment -moment action in the game to be far more indelible than any of this bombastic silliness. 
They also kind of blow all their cash on their first hand, with the earliest of these sequences never being topped, making all the subsequent moments feeling like cheap attempts to turn up the insanity. Flying from train car to train car, crashing and then having to fight enemies while hanging upside down is a brilliant one-two punch, with the sequence at the end of the church chapter being only slightly less memorable. But everything following never lives up to the quality of those two. They also have frequent quick time events, which were already feeling ancient in 2011. The developers did obviously know that taking control away was not the answer for most of what they were trying to do though. For example, near the end of the game when you release an army of necromorphs onto a line of human soldiers, control remains in your hands as the wave of creature rushes below you. It's one of the best and most thematically striking things to happen in the entire series. All of these design choices, the added in quick time events, the huge set pieces, and, and especially the choice to make Isaac speak and become much more powerful tear away layers of immersion that the first game really cherished. It's much harder to feel pulled in and surrounded by the horrifying events around you. Thankfully, like the art design, the sound design's quality remains untouched, and has possibly gotten even better. It's also one of the only places where the game's clear horror inspirations remain fully intact. It's the strongest soldier on the battlefield of immersion in Dead Space 2, and in some ways is the game's unsung hero. In the first game, the sound design was remarkable, but it also tried a bit too hard to get under your skin, which got tiring and worked against the lonely nature of the game. There were also moments where the horror stingers would be off time or would trigger without even looking at enemies. But Dead Space 2, being a lot more action-oriented, but also drawing from a lot more sources of inspiration, the sound design remaining sturdily grounded in horror works a lot better and is a lot less exhausting. The whispering, the scratching of unseen necromorphs, and the excellently crafted noises of the futuristic technology all swirl together to paint a really horrifying soundscape. It's unmistakable. No matter which game you're playing or where you are in the games, you could pretty much identify what was being played by listening alone. The enemies, of course, are the most alien and technically impressive things you hear. Besides the stalkers, which I spoke about earlier, the exploders and the childlike enemies are the two that evoke the most primal fear in me. The exploders sound like belligerence and suffering become flesh. They scream and croak and speak in broken words that you can almost understand. But the childlike necromorphs are terrifying because they sound so much like children, and they attack in such great number. It's a noise that engulfs you and strikes right at the heart of some really natural fears. The the dichotomy between the faster-paced feel of Dead Space 2 and its classically horror-centric sound design finds a lot more success than it does failure. The spikes of music are also strong across the board, where the moaning strings and ambient noises become screaming horns and pounding percussion. It's classically inspired and serves the game's events well, sounding like a nightmare of a nightmare. It thankfully strays away from heavy-handed sci-fi music, and the bleeps and bloops of futuristic tech are all surprisingly and consistently believable. This believability is the main foundation for a lot of the Dead Space series' horror, and also where the horror in Dead Space 2 tends to fail. It's almost entirely derived from the enemies you fight, and all of their conventionally terrifying shapes and sizes. They're inspired by car crash victims, war veterans, and so on. All of them look human or animal enough to come into your own world and allow your mind to accept them as not entirely impossible. Unfortunately, as you spend more time in the game's world, every encounter with the necromorphs becomes more and more comfortable. You kill hundreds of them, and no matter how horrifying they look, they end up becoming a checklist. If you only encountered one or two necromorphs a chapter, the fights would be outrageously tense and the anticipation of the encounter would be wonderfully stressful. But that's kind of an impractical thing to expect from a game like Dead Space. And that's the thing about horror and video games, and most likely one of the major reasons the series moved towards straightforward action with horror flavoring. Eventually, the enemies you fight are only scary when you can't see them. So all the tension has to be carried by the sounds they make, when they're off screen or when the stalkers are planning an attack, or the squeal of the cysts that line some of the walls. It's all aiming to give you chills as you wait to see what's coming next, but it would be impossible to carry that tension through the course of two 10-hour games, nonetheless three. So instead of making the player dread seeing the necromorphs, they made killing them a damn good time, and in turn push the horror elements into the aesthetic realm almost exclusively. It's nice to see things like the general art, music, and sound direction remain great in the transition from the first game to the second, beyond the changes I've covered so far that were made in favor of accessibility and playability, and even beyond the insultingly lazy DLC on the PC, Dead Space 2 was beginning to fester with the sores of modern AAA gaming. Dead Space 2's biggest problem is the fact that it had to stand up against the first game's indie-seeming ambitions while appeasing as many people as possible. But Dead Space 2 is a fantastic game. Even if horror struggles to be 
fun on a conceptual level, Dead Space's world is fun to be in. It's bleak but hilarious, dark but bright, human but still very alien. It's a place that I love spending time exploring, and Dead Space 2 is across the board a better game than the first from a mechanical standpoint. Sadly, with the power of hindsight, it's pretty impossible to not look at this game through the lens of what followed. Dead Space 3 would arrive only a couple years later, and end the series with a lavish whimper.